Hey, just a heads up before we get started. This episode contains descriptions of violence. Hey, Ednard. Hi, Ednard. Hi, Ednard. Hey, Ednard. Out here on the plains, there are still Indians. There are many places to begin a story. But for us here in North America, there is a single point, a constellation of encounters, at which many stories end and many others begin. And we can't move on until we give this point a cold, hard look. On February 26th, 1860, in the middle of the night, a small group of settlers set out across Humboldt Bay towards Indian Island, where several hundred elders, women, and children of the Weot tribe were sleeping. They had just finished the first day of their annual 10-day world renewal ceremony. And, you know, they, they knew not to do it when the men were here, because the men didn't know how to fight. But they waited till the men were out gathering for the next day's ceremony, and they snuck across in canoes and waited till the women and the elders and the children were sleeping and pretty much clubbed them to death, stabbed them to death, beat them to death. Quiet instruments. Quiet instruments where nobody on the other side of the the bay can hear. And then in the morning, people were surprised because the bay was so red with their individual's blood. And the gentleman who purchased the island, Gunther, supposedly didn't know what was going on. But, you know, other stories says that he didn't know what was going on. And the Wea tribe wasn't a warring tribe. We weren't a fighting tribe, you know, we're a peaceful tribe. We, we got along with everybody. And we wanted to live besides everybody, you know, on with everybody. But, you know, people saw more greed into it and they wanted the natural resources that we possessed. And the only way to get to our natural resources was to pretty much massacre us and, and get rid of us. And they should take what was ours and for free, and it was theirs to take. It was, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to talk about, yeah. but it's it's quite interesting when you hear younger generation talking about it. You know, and it's getting the whole story out there, and the the truth out there. It's a hard truth to look at. It is. Yeah. You know, I can say you know some of my ancestors' blood was in this bay. You know, my friend's ancestors' blood was in this bay. I heard stories, you know, that women swam across this bay and that bay is pretty cold with their children and with stab wounds on their side and they swam to the other side just to to survive i also heard stories where they would hide underneath the dead bodies just to stay alive you know and then the one touchy story is where they found the baby stuck to his mother's breast still suckling on it and that was baby albert Mm -hmm. and you know that's how this whole story becomes a bond you know it's be a little, little baby, but I also want to remember that there's other people that survived here that swam across in that cold water just to save their children. Yeah. This was only one of several coordinated massacres that took place within a few days. About a mile south that same day, 58 Wiat were killed. Later that week, almost 80 Wiat were killed on the south fork of the Eel River, then later at Eagle Prairie. Not a single man was brought to trial in the gold rush town of Eureka, on the rugged northern coast of California. Eureka is still a bit of a frontier town, but as we'll see, a lot has changed there since the 1860s. The small frontier outpost has grown into a small city of 27,000. It's still really isolated, out there on its own, surrounded by a seemingly endless sea of towering redwood forests and mountains. It's a port city, situated at the south end of a shallow bay, with only small islands and sand dunes between it and the punishing weather of the Pacific Ocean. So yeah, it's changed a lot. Although some things really do stick around. Like irony, or people who have no sense for it. They want to give away Indian Island to the in- to the Weots. Well, I use Indian Island, I like it, my kids do. I see people there all the time when I'm over there. I don't get how they can take one of our assets and give it. So I'm going to be 
offering over the appraised value for the property. And if I get it, uh, they're giving it away as surplus property. Well, that's fine. But at the same time, that's an asset that is gone from the public forever. The WIATs have made no commitment to allow us to use it. And the city's giving it away. What is this city council thinking of? That was Rob Arkley, millionaire real estate magnate, CEO of Security National Corporation, high-profile right-wing political donor, and Eureka resident. Thankfully, that's the last we're going to hear from him because most of the rest of the city of Eureka is on a whole other wavelength. Now, you might be wondering why, as a podcast with the word ecology in it, we're kicking off our first season with a series of stories about the ways that indigenous people on the Pacific coast of North America are starting to take control of their traditional territories once again. Here's the deal. Once you start to examine how our ecosystems have changed and are changing over time, where they are now, and what trajectory they might take in the future depending on what we do, Perhaps the single most important thing that you will realize is that none of this is possible to understand without understanding the role that indigenous people have played in shaping these ecosystems, which is something Western science has only recently woken up to. And the truth is, their track record is a lot better than the settlers who came afterwards. So since this is also a podcast about design, and where design and ecology intersect, we thought we'd explore one of the simplest possible solutions to a legacy of ecological and social problems that dates back centuries. One that might not work in all contexts, but sure is working in Eureka. Why not just give the land back? Broadcasting from Vancouver, British Columbia, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, this is Future Ecologies. Where your hosts, Adam Huggins and Mendel Skolsky, explore the future of human habitation on planet Earth through ecology, design, and sound. We're going to return to the Wiat, but before we do, we're going to head south to the land of tech bros, John Steinbeck, artichokes, unnecessary software updates, and, you guessed it, unceded indigenous territories. My name is Valentin Lopez, and I'm the chairman of the Ama Mutsun Tribal Band. Our tribe is comprised of the descendants of the indigenous peoples that were taken to missions San Juan Batista and Santa Cruz. Ama Mutsun territory extends from the fragrant chaparral and redwood forests of the Santa Cruz Mountains in the north, down through the fertile Salinas River Valley to Pinnacles National Monument in the south. It's land I know well, having played in tide pools with my family around Monterey Bay when I was a kid. Beautiful. Wild beaches, endless fields of strawberries, Brussels sprouts, garlic, and lettuce, all surrounded by densely forested coastal mountains. And then, of course, there's Silicon Valley right next door. The Amamutsun themselves, however, don't live here anymore. The majority of our people no longer live in our traditional tribal territory. Um, growing up, I spent a large, lot of time during my first five years living in tents. And I lived in, along creeks and, 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 and streams and rivers um, in the Gilroy, Hollister, Trespinos area. And it's hard to believe that in the 1950s, people were still living in tents that way. Our tribe was very isolated. We did not deal with the outside world. And um, um, another important factor there is that many of our members did not read or write. When they would sign their name, they would sign their name with an X and such. So, you know, um, when, when, when Silicon Valley and San Jose started to just really grow and, and develop, I mean, the orchards and the fields that we worked in and stuff like that were being gobbled up and, and turned into um, factories and homes and housing and freeways, etc. And we were squeezed out of here. And because we didn't read or write, we didn't have the skills to survive in Silicon Valley. And our people were forced to move. Most of the Amamutsun now live in the heavily agricultural Central Valley of California, several hours drive away. Depending on traffic. But honestly, it's an incredible feat of resiliency that they're still here at all. Like many indigenous Californians, 
The Amamutsun's troubles began late in the 1770s with the establishment of Spanish missions in their territory. I hope you can bear with us here for a minute because this gets pretty dark. During the mission period, that was brutal times. The way they would capture the Indians to bring them to the mission is they would have the soldiers do an early morning raid on a village that had been scouted out beforehand. And then what they would do is they would target the women and capture the women. And then they would tie the women together thumb by thumb and form a human chain. And once they captured all the women, they would start marching back. Once they started marching them back, they knew that the children would naturally follow their mothers and they knew that it was just a very short time after that before the fathers and men would come in to be with their families. And that's how the Indians were taken to the missions. Then when they got to the mission, a lot of people think that the Indians were taken to the mission, um, you know, to save their soul and, and to follow, and, and that we were evangelized in the name of Jesus, and they're following the footsteps of Jesus, the missionaries, and stuff like that. But if you look at the papal bulls of, eight, of uh, 1453 and, and, and the subsequent ones after that, those papal bulls said that all indigenous people that were not Christians were heathens, pagans, and savages, that we were the enemies of Christ, that we were to be put into perpetual slavery, that our property and our possessions were to be taken from us. And, um, and that's what happened. And that's what the, the, the missions were designed to do, to fulfill the directives of the papal bull. Um, when the missions were closing, the last Padre Presidente of the California mission system he wrote to his superiors in Mexico City and says, we have to find a way to explain what we've done here. He says, all that we have done was baptize, administer a few sacraments, and bury the Indians. He says, there's no Indians left along the coast of California. We are going to be judged harshly and with scorn. We need to explain what happened here. And that's when the mission started. The, the Franciscans started developing the story that the Indians came to the missions voluntarily, that they came to find a better life, that they came to learn agriculture, that they came to find God. And um, nothing could be further from the truth. But the decline of the missions in the early 1800s just brought new hardships. As California was partitioned into ranchos by the Mexican government, and then later annexed by the United States. That was followed by the Mexican period, where we had a continuation of slavery, brutality, rape, etc. And that was followed by the American period. I love you, and the American period was, was, was just, just horrific, and, 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 and again, just genocide and massacres during that time. But it was state-sponsored sanctions and massacres. The very first State of the Union by the very first governor of California, Peter J. Burnett, said that there will be a war of extermination against the California Indians that is to be expected. One of the very first treasury bonds passed by the state of California was passed to pay for the extermination of California Indians. And with that money, they paid bounties, normally 25 cents to $5 bounty for every dead Indian. They also paid for military excursions to go up into the hills where the gold was and to kill the Indians, to clear the land for all the white settlers who were moving in to, to stake their claims up there. It was, in fact, a militia just like the ones Val is describing that committed the Weah massacres on the north coast in 1860. Afterwards, it appears that the men involved were actually attempting to secure payment for their service, or at the very least extort it with the implied threat of further such massacres from the state government. And uh, there was horrendous other laws passed as well, the legalized kidnapping of Indians, mostly children, and they were sold um, as slave, uh, uh, into slavery. And there was a law of indentured servitude, which is slavery. And California Indians were indentured in California into the 1930s. So that's a brutal history. At the turn of the century in 1900, over 96% of the indigenous population had been exterminated, had died. We believe the way our ancestors survived is whenever they came to collect their bounty money 
or anything like that, our ancestors would say, you know, don't insult us by calling us Indians. We're Mexicans. We speak Spanish. That was ta taught to them at the missions. And uh, they had uh, Spanish surnames that were, uh, that's their slave names given to them by the missions. Sanchez, Moreno, Lopez. Having grown up, partly. Like you're only partly grown up? No, like I went to high school on the northern edge of Mutsun territory. Uh-huh. This is particularly difficult history to come to terms with. And it's worth sitting with for a minute. So we're going to take a quick break. What did you want to do in the break? I'm just putting breaks in there. So we have these two tribes in California, the Wiat and the Amamutsun. They've both survived the genocides of the Mission, Mexican, and American periods, but are essentially in hiding late into the 20th century. In the year 2000, the tribal elders came and asked me to run for chair. I was one of the few tribal members um, that, that went to college and they asked me to run for chair. And what they told me is that I need to, they would like me to start speaking up for our tribe to let the people know who we are, who our territory is, and that we are the ones that should be speaking for our lands. And then in 2006, the tribal and, uh, elders um, came to the tribal meeting and told Tribal Council that our creation story tells us that Creator put us here to take care of Mother Earth and all living things, and that we must find a way to do that. And uh, that was that was incredible. You know, you leave there, our people are in poverty. We have no land. We have no... How are we going to take care of land if we don't own any land and stuff like that? And so uh, we just started looking for opportunity. This wasn't quite so simple as it might seem from the outset. Traditionally, our people did not look at themselves as owning the land. We had a responsibility to steward and to take care of the land. But ownership was, the, the, you know, no one owns the land, and we still believe that today. You know, all these land ownership laws are just artificial. You know, a uh, creator owns the land, and it's creator's land. And, uh, you know, we're just, you know, the people who think otherwise are just um, fooling themselves. So, instead of calling a realtor or a bank, they took a different approach. To help us fulfill our obligation as the elders asked us to though, you know, what we did first is we started praying and asking Creator to, to show us the way, a path, so that we can get back on the path of our ancestors and, and, um, and fulfill our obligation to Creator. With that, you know, with our prayers and stuff like that, we received a call from Pinnacles National Park, and we got invited to come on in and become part of the park. Bingo. So we're going to leave Val for a moment at this fateful call and head north to Wiat territory. We are the podcast people. We were slightly, slightly lost. We made it. Are you Michelle? Yes, Michelle. Well, it's nice to meet you. Hi. Mendel. Hi, Mendel. Hi, I'm Adam. Hi, Adam. You want to go first, Michelle or Ted? I guess I'll go first. Uh, my name is Michelle Vassell, and I'm the tribal administrator currently, but I've worked for the tribe over the past 15 years in various capacities. Uh... So, <laughs> I'm Ted Ernest. Of course, I'm the tribal chair for the Wiat tribe and the cultural director, as well as the ceremonial leader for the tribe. I'm Tim Nelson, Natural Resources Director. Um, I've had uh, the pleasure of working in every capacity within the Natural Resources Department from tech specialist and director. I've uh, been employed with the tribe for 11 years. Well, I wasn't going to talk, but uh, <laughs> my name's Eddie Koch. I'm the Natural Resources Specialist with the uh, We Out Tribe. I've been. As you can hear, we met Michelle, Ted, Tim, and Eddie out at the wharf in Eureka. It turns out that right around the year 2000, when Val became the chair for the Amamutsun, that we all were making their own plans. The charge was um, Cheryl Seidner, who was our travel chair at that time, um, and um, I think her sister Leona too. Mm -hmm. And they uh, brought it to council and said, hey, council, uh, there's this piece of land out here, and I'd really like to, um, I would really like to, or we would really like to pursue going after it, and the council voted yes on it, and that meant that we had to do some fundraising. <laughs> we did a lot of fundraising, um, and that involved everything from, in the early days, it was taco sales. We did a lot of tabling, looking for donations, but we sold t-shirts, we sold sweatshirts, we sold um, 
watches and pins. Um, then we started having larger fundraisers. Uh, we did a number of art auctions. We had a lot of uh, benefit concerts, which uh, were really music festivals because we'd have a series of uh, like four or five native artists come. It was a, a lot of people put in for that and a lot of people donated, a lot of people bought things, a lot of people supported it in however way they could by volunteering at the taco sale <laughs> or donating uh, flour uh, to make the tacos or something like that you know we had lots of help in a variety of ways is that so. you at the taco sale <laughs> <laughs> i saw something pass between you and i wasn't sure <laughs> some people she eat the tacos <laughs> <laughs> some people they, they all have their various ways of participating eating the tacos making the tacos <laughs> With the money from these efforts, the Wiat were able to purchase the 1.5-acre village site on Indian Island, known as Tuluat, the site of the 1860 massacre. And when we came to visit, that's exactly where they took us. Welcome guys to Tulawat. Um, this is our home. This is where we did our jump dance, our river no ceremony, which brought balance to the earth. The island is beautiful. It's right across a small channel from the city of Eureka, but it still feels really wild. It's mostly salt marsh, surrounded by eelgrass, and with only a few areas of raised land. The old village site is on one of these areas. Now, it's a nice open lawn, perfect for dancing, with a painted shed and native plantings around struggling to establish. The weather conditions can clearly be harsh. It's pretty much always cloudy every time I visit Eureka, and the few non-native cypresses that have managed to establish are windblown and rugged looking. All in all though, it looks great. But when the Weot returned in 2000 after buying the land, the situation was completely different. Where you are standing is kind of right where um, boats would be pulled in at um, at low tides, and then there were some way runners or some metal rails that went down into the mud flat. Um, and right behind me used to be a, a diesel generator uh, that used to lower a cart on these metal way runners down into the onto the mud flat. Boats would pull up, and they would hook up to this cart, and then the diesel generator would would pull the boats back up onto the land. So it was a dry dock facility. From 1870 to about about 100 years, 1970, the Duff Dry Dock, and uh, everything from wood preservatives to you know the, the pesticides and the, the, the stuff to get the critters off your bottom of your boat um, were were applied to the bottom of these boats, and so this whole area was was super contaminated, um, and it was uh, pentachlorophenols and dioxin. Uh, were, were the main uh, contaminants. And what I heard recently is that dioxin is uh, just about as close to nu nuclear waste uh, that you can get as far as on the, the bad chemicals. That was just allowed to leach right into Humboldt Bay. And this was the hot spot of Humboldt Bay. The contaminant levels were, were off the charts. But then right over here, uh, they actually had a metal foundry as well. And you had arsenic, um, copper, lead, that again were also off the charts. Um, the main retention wall that was being used was, was marine batteries that were holding back the soil from eroding the shellmen and from eroding. And so all the so all the marine batteries, which were leaching lead and other nasty chemicals, acids into Humble Bay. A retaining wall made of batteries. And so um, when the tribe acquired this property in 2000. They also inherited the, the liability, the, the cost of, of cleaning all of this up. And to the tribe, it was, that wasn't anything. They wanted the land back, and we were going to do the cleanup as well. Tim and his crew had their work cut out for them. The reason Tuluat sits kind of above the salt marsh is that it's actually on an enormous six-acre shell midden. Which, for those of you who haven't heard of them before, is essentially the aggregated remains of centuries of Wiat life. Oyster and clamshells, fish bones, ashes, detritus, 
generations of accumulated material that eventually forms stable, fertile land. The island is Swayat people, like it is made by and is a place very deeply connected to Swayat people. There are shell middens, or mounds, like this all along the Pacific coast, and we'll probably do an episode on them one day. But for now, the midden presented its own complexities. Like how to clean up the site without disturbing or damaging literally hundreds of years of Wiat life and history. And this spot here, uh, because of the sensitive nature of the cleanup, uh, we had to uh, go about it um, without heavy equipment. We had to have, I believe it was eight trained archaeologists, Haswopper trained uh, archaeologists, to um, screen every shovel, every shovelful of dirt that came out. Uh, it was approximately 23 cubic yards of, uh, of material, which equated to about 26 tons of soil. Uh, it actually was 88 55-gallon drums. Uh, and we did that for a week straight. Um, and then once we had that, we then had to uh, bring in a barge, which uh, basically uh, took the 88 uh, 55 gallon drums off and then uh, we shipped them off to a, a facility I believe in Utah for uh, incineration and disposal. Uh, we were then able to do uh, in situ um, contamination removal which uh, using uh, an oxidation treatment uh, called Coolox, uh, they were able to come in and essentially inject the soil with an oxidizer to neutralize the, the remaining 5% of the dioxin and plant chlorophenols and then we had some monitoring wells that were installed. And um, once we got it to, to acceptable levels, um, then it was time to, to cap the site. And that's when uh, our EPA folks uh, came in and um, paid for the, for the capping of the site. Uh, and then brought in, uh, I believe it was 25, 2,500 tons of soil and uh, Coast Seafoods, a local oyster company, had worked with us to bring in some oyster shells because we wanted, we knew it was, it was artificial soil, but they wanted to get that, that feel of a midden. And so uh, Coast Seafoods um, donated tons and tons of oyster shells, crushed up oyster shells that were added into the, to the soil. And then once we had that done, uh, we came through and hydroseeded it with a, with a natural, uh, a native uh, seed mix. This project would take years, but as you can hear, the WIAT were great at forming partnerships and taking advantage of available funding and expertise, especially from the EPA. But in the early days, when they were just getting started, they attracted the attention of a critical ally, the city of Eureka. In 2004, the city council voted, unanimously, to return the 40 acres of salt marsh surrounding the Tulawat village site to the WIAT. I, I know of, at least since the 70s, talk between the tribe and the city of Eureka about this island and transferring lands back. We have people have been talking forever about coming back to the island, but I think once talk started happening with Eureka and people stopped being adversarial towards each other and looking at solving a problem and solving the issues that were here and, and returning we have people to this place, that's where I think the real change happened. And that, like a lot of that has to do with the uh, candlelight vigils that we held for, you know, how many candlelight vigils did we have? Too many to count. Yeah. But it those, was too many to count. Those were, you know, the people of Eureka were coming to those. It wasn't just like the Wiat people. It was Wiat people and the people of Eureka were coming together on, at those vigils and saying, hey, we want to support this or we want the tribe to be back on the island. So it was, I think it was all healing of the community and getting to know each other as neighbors. I and think so, that was, Michelle had the key is that's uh, the healing. The community came back and wanted to heal. And, you know, they made their the talks with the tribe, and we got the island back with the help of the city. Mm -hmm. You know, and that city was the first to ever give back mm -hmm. sacred lands. And, you know, that's a big accomplishment for the community. And it's all because people want to heal. I mean, there's so much going on in today's world, today's society, the healing process needs to be in. And where else to begin the healing process? Right here in the center of the world, right here. Tua, this is where it begins. Speaking of where the world begins, when we left off with Val Lopez, 
He and the Amamutsun had just received a call from Pinnacle's National Monument, and they entered into a relationship with the park, helping to restore culturally sensitive areas with important plants for basketry, as well as to help with the restoration of California condor populations. Other people started hearing of our relationship with Pinnacles, and they started contacting us and inviting us to become part of that. And that included state parks, um, Bureau of Land Management. New doors were opening, and they were thrilled to be caring for their territory again, at least on public lands. But the center of their world was still a long ways away. To understand our ancestors, you have to understand our creation story. Um, our creation story takes place at Mount Umanum, which is on the uh, tallest peak in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, our creation story tells us that Creator very specifically uh, picked our people to live within our traditional tribal territory. And Creator gave us the responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and all living things. Um, that's a sacred covenant that our tribe has with the Creator. That covenant was returning the Amamutsun to their lands, but Mount Amanam itself was inaccessible to them. The defunct facilities of the Cold War era Almaden Air Force Station sat squarely on top of their sacred mountain. Almaden Air Force Radar Station, established in 1954 by Air Defense Command, precursor to NORAD, it was intended to give early warning of an impending Soviet aerial attack. What is it with Californians in building industrial facilities on sacred sites and then just leaving them to decay? Yeah, the parallels between these two stories are actually quite striking. Like what happened next. So I am Ana Ruiz, Acting General Manager for the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District. Back in uh, about 2009, we started to think about the opportunity to restore the mountaintop. We had acquired it in uh, 1986, uh, but there were a lot of issues with that, that mountaintop. It, it was the site of a former uh, Air Force base. There were over 80 buildings on the mountain. And uh, contamination issues as well uh, as related to Air Force bases. And during that work and our research, we, we knew that this was a site that was important to native cultures. And we knew that Amanam itself, the word, uh, comes from the root word, word for resting place of the hummingbird, which is uh, Ohlone. Uh, uh, comes from the Ohlone language. So we knew there was a d deep connection there. And so during our research, we um, reached out and uh, were able to make a, a really deep connection with the Amamutsun tribal band, who uh, have participated with us from the start in, in planning the site, along with many, many other stakeholders. They, they were one of many. Um, and we have forged really deep relationships with them. We got a call from Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, and um, they um, were going to be redesigning the mountaintop um, as unintrusively as they could, but they are also recognizing our tribe as a stakeholder, um, a long-term stakeholder at Mount Umanum, and they asked us to come on in so that we can talk about what our interest would be for Mount Umanum. Uh, before the meeting, we met at Tribal Council and we talked about it. And what we said is that Mount Umanum has always been a place for prayer um, for our people, our ancestors. And it needed to be restored as a place for prayer. We needed to, so we wanted access um, to the summit. And we wanted an area where we could pray to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west to help us ensure balance in our life. It was a very long process, um, and it started in 2011 um, with the 3.2 million appropriation from the, from the federal government. The Army Corps of Engineers came in and did the first phase of work, which was the abatement and remediation of the buildings. Uh, once that was done, we came in and did the demolition work and uh, removed uh, all the buildings uh, except for the one uh, uh, notable building that can be seen from the, the, uh, the, the valley, which is the radar tower. Which is a monolithic rectangle that stands out on the mountain range. When I was in high school in the valley, it always kind of creeped me out. The kids would tell lots of strange stories about it, which I will not repeat here. 
when the military came in, you know, in order to be able to put all of these buildings on the mountaintop, they had to pretty much blaze the um, the hilltop. And so we were able to come in and bring back a lot of those those soils to return the contours, return the swales, um, and, and help restore that mountaintop. It was really important for us to bring in native plants uh, to that location. And so we collected the seed uh, and worked with um, partners to propagate those and are now in the process of restoring the site with new seedlings, over 2,000 um, that we're gonna be planting on the site. And that work has already begun and it, it will continue. And I think one of the interesting things for the, for the public to be able to see is the gradual progression of those plants coming back to the hilltop yeah. and seeing the whole site revegetate and regenerate and restore. And then of course, there's the prayer and ceremonial circle which I got to see when I visited the site this past spring. They developed the spiritual circle, that, that rock wall that encircles it. And I can tell you that right there far exceeded our expectations. We thought we were gonna get a little six foot by six foot ring, um, you know, laid around it and that was gonna be it. But they sure um, made a, a wall that will allow people to recognize how important um, the spirituality is and to understand our spiritual practices. And then Midpen took it one step further. The Yamamutsun had started their own land trust in 2012 to allow them to enter into formal agreements, not to own, but to steward the land. The more we worked with them, the more we realized we, we share such strong values um, about, about land, about stewardship, about conservation. And so, there were conversations that were had with them about um, whether this would be something that would be of interest. And, and then uh, we brought uh, the idea to our board as well. And it just seemed like the right, the right fit. And um, well, you know, cultural conservation easements, um, they, they are in place. Well, conservation easements in general are, are in place to protect conservation values of, of a particular property or piece of land um, in perpetuity. And in this case, it's, it's specifically for the cultural resources and the cultural values of the landscape. And so working with them on this cultural conservation easement has been an opportunity to ensure that those conservation values are protected in per perpetuity. We as, as MidPen Open Space are here for the long term. You know, that is our goal is to stay here in perpetuity so we can protect these properties and these lands for generations to come. And that's the same philosophy for the Amamutsun tribal band. This cultural conservation easement grants the Amamutsun permanent rights to help steward the mountaintop for natural resource conservation, cultural relearning, and public education in partnership with Midpen. After centuries of abuse, Mount Amanam and the Amamutsun have been returned to one another. We've experienced uh, brutal attempts at colonization in three different um, eras. And uh, all each of those eras, they wanted to destroy and dominate, eliminate, exterminate our culture, our environments, our spirituality, our humanity. And they almost succeeded. So our people had not been a Mount Umanum for well over 200 years. Before we did that, here's an important point, is that our tribe, <clears throat> due to our history, our tribe lost a lot of its indigenous knowledge. And that was an embarrassing thing to admit because people would say, want to know how you say this in, in the Mutsun language? How do you say that? We didn't know. Tell us, you know, um, tell us a bear story or tell us this story or that story we didn't know, or how did our people traditionally do this or that, or our ceremonies. We lost a lot of that knowledge, and it was embarrassing to admit that. But then, as we thought about it as a tribe, we realized that's not our fault. But that doesn't excuse us either. We have an obligation to relearn that knowledge so that we can get back on the path and continue the path of our ancestors. Back at Tulawad on the north coast, 
that we ought were facing a similar dilemma as they completed the physical restoration of the center of their world. I mean, when we started our ceremonies, you know, we lost our ceremonies when the massacre happened. You know, even though we have elders that still know ours, but during the days through the boarding schools, they really don't talk about the stories because, you know, that's something that they still are afraid of being beat for and you know you can't talk your stories you can't do your traditional dances you can't speak your language that still traumatizes them and it wasn't if it wasn't for our sister tribes like the Yurok's and the Hoopas to come in and help us bring back to what we lost you know we wouldn't be here today you know and I have to give credit to them because they they helped bring right back our our dances you know and once they we got our feet settled in then they told us go with it and create what you gotta create now and we create our own now so they gave us the the protocols for it and you can't beat that I mean where else would you get another tribe coming and helping another tribe bring back its culture and its tradition we're here today because of them with help from their fellow tribes in the region the Wiat were finally able to dance their world renewal ceremony last time the world renewal ceremony was in 1860 February of 1860 mm-hmm. And then we, we completed the ceremony because it was never completed in 1860. We completed that ceremony in 2014. So next year's ceremony will be a whole, all brand new ceremony. It was not a completion one, it's a whole new ceremony starting. We just had to complete that ceremony that our ancestors can complete back then. Because when we started, the, when we got the young men together to do the ceremony, we went up to the Botanical Gardens at CR, and that's where we had our first camp. And the next morning, the boys woke up, and said, "Hey, this doesn't feel right. We don't. We we're not supposed to be here." And me and a couple of hours asked them where where were we supposed to be, and they all said we're supposed to be on the island. And you know, I called the natural resources the time it was Steven. I said, "Hey, Steven, we need the boat. We're going out to the island." <laughs> and for the next ten days, that's where we were. We were here. And the boys were feeling, they said it felt right because then they started making their traditional stools here by hand. They were carving them by hand. They felt at home. They felt at peace. And they were, they were comfortable here, not at the first camp. And to see them riding in the bay in the dugouts, because we had the traditional dugouts out here as well, for them to ride in the bay, you know, just going out in the dugouts and paddling away, they felt... Like they're, they said, they felt like they were back in the, the early days. And they even said that while they were here that they felt some of the ancestors here with them. You know, and that is a tremendous feeling. And then they worked on regalia here. We worked on the regalia in that building. And when it rained, we all stayed in that building. And they were, you know, we started getting drops. And then the young man got up the next day and they started patching up the tin on the roof. <laughs> and, you know, it, it was home to them for the next 10 days. So they started taking care of that. And then we started practicing our dances and, and doing the ceremony. And to see them do the actual moves was even more magical. You know, and they, it just came natural to them for, de, for them to do it because they haven't done it in so many years. And, you know, we had a Yurok elder here that was helping them with it. But it just came natural with the flow, the, with the way they moved. They, they, I mean, they were some that moved like birds, hummingbirds, and, you know, it was, a, it was an amazing feeling. And when the girls came over, that's where you felt it was connected, it was united. And to have the girls here and to dance and sing with us was the completion of it, the connection of it. To hear them dancing with their dresses and, you know, the dresses when they dance, it, they make music. They talk, the dresses talk and you can hear the music and just to hear them dance with the men was like and nothing you can think of I mean I've, we've been to brush dances we've been to other dances but that one dance is just like something you just it's like puts peace in your heart and puts you know peaceful thoughts in your way you know and that last dance that we did here he creator made it possible so we can do the finish of the last dance here and once we could do that last dance, it started pouring down rain. And so that made it, we were understood that, okay, we, we did, we were able to do that one last dance and complete it here that day. And so we were able to get everybody back to the other side. 
while the men stayed here to make sure everything was taken care of. You know, we, we got our elders and our, our the women and our children back to the other side. And when everybody was gone, we just sat down and talked and just said, it's complete. We completed it. In March of 2014, the Wiat completed a world renewal ceremony that had been left unfinished for over 150 years. In September of 2017, the Amamutsun held their first ceremony in over 200 years on Mount Amanam. And that same month, the Eureka City Council voted unanimously to return the rest of Indian Island to the Wiat. There's a lot of soul searching going on right now, in both the US and Canada, about how best to acknowledge and provide restitution for the mistakes of the past. But for many indigenous groups, returning to the land is at the heart of this process. And most settler communities have historically been unwilling to do what is asked of them to return at least some of the land. Eureka and the Wiat, Midpen and the Amamutsun, they prove that, at least in some cases, it really can be that simple. And both groups show a sensitivity to how they might be perceived by the broader public. We have people were displaced, like already. We we won't pr- continue that practice. We're just looking to, you know, buy properties as they become available, um, restore the lands that we can get, keep the the um, island for public use and for ceremonial use, and restore it to what it used to be. And Val echoes this. The other thing that we asked Midpen is that that be a place for prayer, not only for the Amamutsun, not only for the other tribes of the of the area or California, but it'd be a, a place for prayer for all people. So it's, um, no, regardless of the background or the religious beliefs or anything like that, that's a place for people to go so that they can have a quiet time to reflect and to pray and to ask for healing, to ask for vision, to ask for help, to ask that the families are taken care of. Oh, it's, it, it's, it blows me away every time I go up there. It's breathtaking. And it really gives you a sense of place in the landscape. Um, and the ability to kind of reflect who you are, where you are, and, and a sense of time, and, um, and a connection to everything around you. Um, and, you know, I, my hope is that as people come up, um, they're able to connect as well and and also be able to understand who they are, where they come from, and that they're connected to every living thing on this planet. If you're still a bit fuzzy on the connection to ecology, you should go visit these places. Mount Amanam is now open to the public year-round, and the Wiat who just became the first tribe to receive an Excellence in Site Reuse Award from the EPA, still welcome the public to Tuluat, although access is complicated by its remote location. Both of these places were seriously trashed, and through collaboration between the tribes, government agencies, nonprofits, and the community, they can once again support a human presence, not to mention the wildlife. And this is uh, Humble Bay Alice Clover. It's a, a, rare, a rare plant species that uh, we're hoping to, uh, you can kind of see it all kind of coming back in some of the Spartina, tre- the treated areas, the Salt Marsh Restoration Project, uh, uh, this Humble Bay Alice Clover is coming back. So this is one of the main uh, stopover points for Pacific Flyway. So for Black Brant, uh, coming up and down the Pacific Flyway, um, that is a, this is a major stopover point, especially given the, uh, the recent decline of eelgrass in some of the bays uh, across California. Uh, our, the eelgrass population here is so robust. And, and, of course, Humboldt Bay oysters are going to taste that much sweeter. Or saltier. Depending on how you like it. And as for Mount Amanam? It's home to uh, an incredible um, array of, of uh, serpentine uh, thriving plants, which are unique and rare to our region. <laughs> oh, I love, I love rocks. I'm a big rock hound, and I have my own con- collection here in my office and at home. <laughs> Just like plants and animals, rocks also provide a story of the landscape and and what's occurred here for millennia. Our ancestors started taking care of Mother Earth and all living things. They developed bear clan, deer clan, fish clan, etc. 
and our ancestors were responsible for taking care of the habitat and, and the wildlife of their namesake. And so they learned what foods they needed. Uh, you know, but our, our hope in the future is that we can have enough um, funding to, uh, to, do, to keep our stewards working full time and working on the lands of the parks, of the, the open space districts, of the land trusts, and uh, even private, private lands as well. Um, that's what our people need to do is to take care of the lands and, um, and, and that's what we work on. Returning land, whether through cultural conservation easements or title and deed, can have a huge social and ecological impact. It's a good place to start. Where else but where the world began? It begins again. Thanks for listening to our very first full-length episode of Future Ecologies. We'll be back in a few weeks. Please tell everybody that you know. Subscribe, rate, and review our show wherever podcasts can be found. In this episode, you heard Ted Hernandez, Michelle Vassell, Valentin Lopez, Tim Nelson, Eddie Koch, and Anna Ruiz. This has been an independent production of Future Ecologies. Our first season is supported in part by the Vancouver Foundation. If you'd like to help us make the show, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash futureecologies. To say thanks, we'll be releasing exclusive mini-episodes every other week. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and iNaturalist. The handle is always Future Ecologies. The Amamutsun are currently trying to prevent one of their sacred sites from being transformed into a gravel quarry. Find out more at protecturistock.org. We'll include a link in the show notes. Special thanks to Nicole Yarus, Kirsty Cameron, Erica Terrence, and Sarah Sachs. Music in this episode was produced by Sunfish Moonlight, K-Maths, and Port Bow. You can find a full list of musical credits, show notes, and links on our website, futureecologies.net. The song you heard at the opening of the episode is part of a poem by Brian Tripp about the Weot Massacre. It's called, The Sun Set Twice on the People That Day. Here it is, in full. Hey, Ednut, I yet, I yet, hey, 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 yet, I yet, I yet, he 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 yet, no wit, he yet, he yet, I yet. I get it, hey, hey, it, hey, I get it, hey, it, hey, hey, it, hey, it, hot, hey, it, I get it. Hey, 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 Out on the island, in the middle of the bay, the sun set twice on the people that day. The world they were making, someone else was taking, saying, Eureka, I found it, claiming it's mine to own. Out on the island, in the middle of the bay, surrounded by greed that had come and planted its seed, the sun set twice on the people that day. Then came muffled silence, sneaking up out of the dark, something so evil the dogs couldn't even bark. Not a word was spoken until the silence was broken by the sound of dying and so much crying it seemed like the end of the world. Out on the island, in the middle of the bay, the sun set twice on the people that day. Fine lines, bloodlines, spilled, splashed and splattered. 
bodies broken, beaten, battered, faith torn, tested, tattered, shattered to the core, not giving up breath, not giving in to death, survivors scattered into their darkest night. Out on the island in the middle of the bay, the sun set twice on the people that day. We know it's not over. We know it's not done. We know for us, our fight's just begun. Meanwhile, we must take time to regroup. We must take time and rest because we know daylight's coming and we have to give it our best. Out on the island, in the middle of the bay, the sun set twice on the people that day. Then came cold morning, revealing light, all brand new and shining bright, making promises of a brand new day with a brand new way for the island out in the middle of the bay. Hey, Ednet, hi, Ed, hi, yeah. Hey, it, hey, it. Hey, it, hey, it, hey, yeah. Hi, it, hi, yeah. Whoa, whoa.